So respiratory failure is very, very common in our scenario. We see that the most common cause of patients getting into the intensive care unit is somewhere respiratory failure, which could be related to the underlying causes of sepsis. Sepsis is the most common patient which you will find in Indian ICUs. And now with the antimicrobial resistance, taking such a large turn and huge number of patients getting the infections which are uh, resistant to the conventional antibiotics, it becomes paramount that we disseminate knowledge regarding uh, the respiratory failure as well as the most common causes people come to your ICU and how to tackle these kind of problems. So respiratory failure is mostly uh, the failure of your ventilatory system for its basic function of uh, getting out the bad air, which is the carbon dioxide, and inhaling the oxygen, which is the uh, good gas inside for oxygenation of your uh, blood, which of course is the reason that uh, uh, all the processes in the body are taking place. We are dependent on oxygen. We have all read this in, uh, in basic sciences. I don't need to press upon this fact. Uh, and respiratory failure could be the failure of your system as a whole to get this gas exchange going. Apart from this function, respiratory system has other functions, but this is the major function which gets affected when somebody is in respiratory failure. It could be of two types, which we have all known. It could be lung failure per se, which, para, uh, which gives rise to type 1 hypoxemic respiratory failure. On the other hand, it could be the pump failure, which means your muscles, either your muscles or your brain is not producing enough signals to give uh, the, the signal required for respiratory muscles to carry out the function of breathing, which is related to respiration. So that can lead to type two hypercapnic respiratory failure because your muscles are not moving. So carbon dioxide washout is affected, which leads to type two respiratory failure. Now, acute respiratory failure could be hypoxemic and hypercapnic, which is the major definition whereby we define it. Uh, the hypoxemic respiratory failure means that your PaO2 levels are less than 80 in your arterial blood gas. And the hypercapnic failure means that your PCO2 levels are more than 45. We all know there are various causes of these types of respiratory failure. Most common causes are there on, uh, uh, in front of your screen. So pulmonary edema, pneumonia, acute lung injury, atelectasis, aspiration, pulmonary contusion, acute pneumonitis, pulmonary embolism, and other causes are the major reasons your uh, patient might be in hypoxemic respiratory failure. On the other hand, the hypercapnic failure could be due to the uh, decreased action of your pump, which could be due to less signals from your CNS, which could be due to CNS depression, due to N number of causes. It could be any kind of stroke. It could be the drugs which are affecting your brain, or it could be trauma. The brainstem injury also can lead to this kind of respiratory failure, spinal cord injury, because all the nerves down from the brain pass through your spinal cord to give rise to peripheral uh, uh, nerves, which are responsible for signaling of all the tissues of the body. Neuropathy, neuromuscular junction is another area where your respiratory muscles could be involved. And as an example, we can cite myasthenia gravis. We very, very commonly find these patients in respiratory failure when everybody is puzzled ki karan kya hai ki respiratory failure mein patient hai. Uh, when you go to uh, the basic history of, of, of the person, you'll come to find out that these uh, kind of episodes have been recurring in the past. And the major cause uh, which is responsible for it is neuromuscular junction dysfunction due to myasthenia gravis. Myopathy, on the other hand, can also lead to respiratory failure. Now, this has to be a severe kind of a myopathy. Mostly, these are congenital disorders. However, there are certain disorders for example, motor neuron disease, which could be responsible for uh, uh, these kind of failure and myopathies. Kyphoscoliosis, on the other hand, we all know that uh, there could be pump failure due to uh, this, this kind of a problem, which doesn't let your patient breathe in a proper manner to wash out the CO2. On the other hand, we have seen increased load uh, could be the cause of hypercapnia, which is present in COPD, asthma, cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis, which are causes of obstructive airway diseases. Now, due to the increased load on the patient muscle, 
patient gets tired out because of uh, uh, the inability of the body to cope up with so much of increased respiratory rate, the body gets tired and gives uh, away at some point wherein they require some kind of uh, intervention from our side, which could be the non-invasive ventilation. We go on to this case wherein we are discussing a 61 year old gentleman who's morbidly obese. He's been a never smoker. There is no history of alcohol, but he is suffering from drowsiness, uh, which is increasing for the past one week. His wife is also unwell with de decreased mobility. She couldn't come to the hospital. So the history of snoring and daytime sleepiness is not very, very consistent. The attendants who are the sons and daughters of this particular gentleman cannot correlate whether they have seen him dozing off during the day. In addition, there is no history of fever, cough, burning, micturition, headache, rash, or any joint pains recently. The examination reveals this person to be very, very drowsy, which is uh, who's un, uh, arousable to incomprehensible speech, but he has no focal neurological deficits. The rest of the systemic examination is not significant, but clinically he looks dehydrated. Once we did the investigations, the ABG revealed type two respiratory failure with high bicarbonate levels. Also, there was low sodium level of 120 milligram per deciliter, normal uh, uh, total blood count, CBC, uh, normal LFT, urea creatinine, however, a slightly high potassium of 5.6. The serum osmolality was 281, urinary sodium was 13, and the urine osmolality was 375. Uh, would like to make this session a little bit uh, 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 interactive. So if anybody has any kind of an idea what we are dealing with, they could type their uh, uh, findings in the chat box. Let's make it a little bit. Uh... Absolutely, doctor. So what do you think about the case one over here? She has already given all the diagnosis here. What exactly they have found it out here? What are the symptoms? What they can see in initial stage? If you know anything, please write it on the chat box. TKA, Dr. Prashanti. I know Raghavi, hi, hi, Raghavi. Yes, you have mentioned hyponatremia, SIADH, uh, Akshay, uh, CO2 narcosis from uh, uh, Koritala. Divya. So CO2 narcosis, yes, I have mentioned there is type 2 respiratory failure in ABG with a high bicarbonate. Now, hyponatremia per se could be the cause of this drowsiness. However, in addition to sodium levels, there are other things which are associated over here with this kind of a patient. DKA okay. is something which we might think about this patient, however, I haven't mentioned diabetes in, in said patient's history. And this patient is, is uh, about middle age, more so elderly. He's going towards 65. If it was a young patient in 20s or maybe a teenage uh, kind uh, of a person, I would have thought uh, DKA because these are the patients who present per se uh, without any history of diabetes in the past with DKA. But this gentleman doesn't have any history of diabetes. But yes, I have mentioned morbidly obese. So uh, let me add on this fact that his urine routine was perfectly normal with negative ketones. So DKA, yes, you can keep it in, uh, in your uh, differentials, but this patient did not have any features, other features of uh, DKA. And uh, Raghavi, uh, as well as Aman, Siddharth, and we have different answers. Dr. Ghori, yeah. Dr. Ghori, I was looking for the person who first said OSA. So uh, Dr. Dr. Ghori Rahis. said OSA yes. uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the outset with some uh, other people also joining it. Yes, uh, this is a classical case of obesity hypoventilation syndrome. So though we did not have any history, you know, your, their history can be corroborated from their partners who, who see them every night with the apneas happening during the night. Now, there is a difference between obesity hypoventilation syndrome and obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea per se means that the apneas are happening during the sleep only. Obesity hypoventilation, on the other hand, means that 
the primary mechanism of respiratory failure in a particular patient is actually hypoventilation. So hypoventilation is something which is at the denominator of obesity hypoventilation patients, uh, which, is, which is very, very classical. One way of differentiating these people from uh, other kinds of type 2 respiratory failure is that they have retention of bicarbonate, which is telling you that the, the, the acidosis, the respiratory acidosis has been happening over a period of weeks to months rather than over days to weeks. So that is something which you need to keep in mind. If your pretest probability of OHS, which is obesity hypoventilation, is very, very high, you directly go on to check their ABG. However, if you are in doubts what is happening here or you do not have ABG readily available at your place, you could go on to check their serum bicarbonate levels and if more than 27, this patient is highly suspicious for the eventuality of obesity hypoventilation syndrome. Now, 80% of patients of obesity hypoventilation syndrome do actually suffer from ob uh, obstructive sleep apnea which is the obstruction in your trachea or your breathing tubes due to a mechanical obstruction which is happening during the sleep. Your, mechanic, your, uh, your airway is getting com uh, compressed due to lack of tone of your neck muscles or due to the obesity, which is pushing your di diaphragm higher up into your neck, causing the compression of your breathing tubes. Hence, your brain is constantly stimulated during the nighttime to get up and breathe because the brain is not getting the optimal level of oxygen during the night. That leads to frequent amount of apneas during the night, followed by arousals. Arousals are very, very important, associated with desaturation, which can be easily seen in a sleep study, and then the scoring can be done wherein we score the number of uh, apnea, hypoapneas in, uh, in a particular hour and tell the patient to use a CPAP during the night, which can take away this kind of obstruction during their sleep. Now, this was the VBG which was taken off the patient because he was morbidly obese, although we had ordered for an ABG, we could only get uh, a VBG. So you can clearly see that the pH is 7.29, PCO2 is 68, which is high. Uh, both uh, uh, and, and the PO2 is 44, though it's a venous gas. So venous gas is also important. If you're uh, suspecting type 2 respiratory failure in your patient, it's not always that you require an arterial blood gas. If you can see the oxygen saturation with the help of an oximeter, a VBG could well be taken if you're unable or do not know how to take an ABG. Here you can see the bicarb is, is uh, higher. So already the patient is compensating in terms of type 2 respiratory failure.